This is the Create Your Own Life Show, where we talk about things that matter. We're free thinkers and we don't believe in participation trophies. We're not afraid and unapologetically ourselves. It's time to create your own life. Hey, what is up, everybody? It is Tuesday. It is the 30th of November, 2021, and this is the Create Your Own Life Show. Thank you so much for spending your Tuesday with me, everyone. Uh, I am on travel this week, so things have been a little bit interesting. Um, The intro to this episode was actually recorded before I got uh, traveling to Florida. I'm helping my parents to, to move. They've been in New Jersey for gosh, 60-something years, and they finally decided they're done with winter, so they're moving to Florida, and we're actually in the process of helping them move. So shout out to Joseph on the team that's been caring a little bit more and uh, making things work this week as I'm kind of on the move and not exactly getting things in terms of the files he needs to him on time and things like that, but hey, family calls, so we make it happen. Hope you guys are having an amazing week. Hope you had a great Thanksgiving. I know I did with my family as uh, we hosted this year. And uh, we haven't used this oven before, so the turkey took like eight hours to cook, which is way beyond what it's supposed to do. But hey, you learn. It came out perfect. It was just a really long wait for a turkey. Hope you guys enjoyed it with your family as well. We have a great episode for you today that was recorded a little bit ago, and uh, it wasn't originally done as a video episode, so I was excited to share it with you with Kelly Earnhardt Miller. And she's the daughter of NASCAR legend Dale Earnhardt that we lost in the 2001 Daytona 500. And, you know, not only is she the daughter of Dale Earnhardt, she also runs JR Motorsports and has been a real pioneer in the motorsports world. So I learned a ton from her about racing, about what you have to think about, about running a team, about keeping sponsors going. And really what it is like following in the footsteps of a legend. This is a really, really great interview. I hope you guys enjoy it as well. Before we get into this episode, though, I want to quickly uh, thank a couple companies for bringing you this episode. Shout out to our friends over at MyPillow. You can get up to 66% off of select products. If you use my promo code, which is CYOL over at MyPillow.com, up to 66% off of select products. Also, shout out to our friends over at Audible. Um... Right now, I, or they're offering you, first of all, a free audiobook download and a free month of their service. Right now, I am reading In Trump Time by Dr. Peter Navarro. I'm just about done with that book. Quite an interesting read. And I've already got on my wish list um, the next one I want to read, um, which I'm going to get tomorrow, by the way, because my, my Audible membership turns over every first of the month. And that is The Real Anthony Fauci by Robert Kennedy Jr. So I'm excited to grab that book. So if you want to grab either of those books for free, courtesy of Audible, just head over to jeremyryanslate.com slash book. That is jeremyryanslate.com slash book. Also, do not forget to check out this show on YouTube or on Rumble. And if you're listening to the audio podcast version right now, do me a favor and hit that subscribe button wherever you're listening. And if you are listening on Apple Podcasts, do me a favor and leave us a rating and a review as well. All right. Let's get into this interview with Kelly Earnhardt Miller. Welcome to the Create Your Own Life show, Kelly Earnhardt Miller. Hello, how are you? Hey, I'm doing awesome. (laughs) I'm doing awesome, Kelly. I really, really appreciate you hanging out with me today. I just finished your book, Drive, Nine Lessons to Win in Business and in Life. And I know you're in the middle of a busy, busy, busy press tour, so I appreciate you taking out some time to hang out with us today. Yeah, I'm excited to uh, to do this. I've I had a little bit of a break, so I'm I'm uh, rested for for uh, today's interviews, and uh, it's been fun. Uh, the book's been out, you know, several weeks now, so um, just uh, it's fun to talk about it and fun to to help people. Absolutely. Well, I I, I know you've kind of talked about it a lot, so I, I don't really want to talk about the idea of a. Uh, a woman in a man's world because you've kind of said that really wasn't ever a thing for you because you've always just kind of been in racing and that's always kind of been the thing so I won't beleaguer that too much but I the thing I, I did find interesting is you come from a long line of racers you know being your your grandfather Ralph your father Dale your brother Dale Jr. and I, I guess like looking at 
having um, a family name like that, Kelly, has that made that difficult, easier for you? Or what is that, I guess, kind of challenge wise coming from a, a long family line of racers? Well, I think it presents, you know, a lot of pros and cons, right? So, I mean, there's lots of pros to have a family uh, lineage like that and uh, that, that uh, it, you automatically have a lot of respect and a lot of integrity and, and so on uh, in, in our industry. Um, and of course, you know, tons of challenges as well, growing up in a famous family, growing up with a lot of expectations, um, you know, and I, I allude to a lot of that in my book in terms of wanting to be authentic and approachable, which is something I think we struggled with, you know, through our life of, of living up to the Dell and Hart legacy and, um, you know, what's that supposed to look like and what can you talk about, what you can't talk about, you know, and in my book, I talk about my relationship with my dad as a dad, not Dell and Hart, the race car driver. And, um, and so processing all that, you know, is, uh, just having that family heritage and, and lineage, but um, you know, it's, it's provided us this path through, through NASCAR to, to carry forward and to carry on and, and to do what we do, uh, you know, in the racing world. So um, it's, it's what we've known and what we've done. So I can't imagine, uh, you know, everybody always says, you know, what's it like to grow up as Dylan Hart's daughter? And I'm like, well, I don't know. I didn't grow up any differently. You know? I don't have anything to compare it with. And, uh, you know, so I only hear stories of how other families did things versus our family. And that's what I can compare it to. Right. Yeah. And, and I will say, I really appreciated your willingness to really just candidly talk about, you know, what that situation was for you, like growing up, because those things are what make us who we are today. And, and one of the things that you, you had mentioned is you mentioned, um, you know, as a child, you had had, we're living with your mom and you had had the house had burned down. You had actually end up moving in with your dad. And you said that at that point in time, you realized that was one of the most important things for you was to be a big sister to Dale. And that's kind of a theme through your story. I guess, how important to you was your relationship with your brother, Dale? Yeah, it's always been right there because our parents divorced when we were really young and then we lived with our mom and she had third shift jobs. So it's kind of the mother in place, you know, at a really young age and looking after Dale. And, um, and then the house, our house burned down. We moved in with our dad. He was starting his career, traveling a lot, met Teresa, married. They were off a lot uh, to the races and, and we would be with relatives and whatnot. So it kind of was just really a natural migration and progression of our relationship, uh, to kind of be for me anyway, to be that person that kind of looked after him. And, uh, he was a very, I was the one that was, you know, more take control, more in charge. And he was the one that didn't like conflict, just let things be. And so it was kind of naturally a good situation, you know, for me to be the older sister and, um, and to kind of look over his shoulder and it's, um, you know, we've continued to this day doing business together and, and me managing his career and, um, and he being able to focus on what he enjoys from the racing aspect and now the broadcasting aspect and me to really focus on the business aspect of what we do together. So, um, it's unusual because a lot of people, you know, they're like, well, I'm, I'm don't have a relationship like that with my brother or sister. <laughs> and um, it is unusual, but it's just, you know, it's the way we've worked all this time. And, um, and it, yeah, as we get older and we both married, we both have kids, we both have families, obviously, you know, there's a lot more separation than there ever has been because for the longest time, it was kind of just the two of us. Uh, we know way through life and, and business. So. Well, I guess to that point too, one of the things that I've really found surprising is you, you mentioned, um, I, th I think it was around ninth grade or something like that. You actually ended up going to military school for a year to kind of just be with Dale there as well. And I, I don't know many people that would be excited to go to military school, but it's actually something that you asked to do so you could be there for your brother. I did. And you kind of have to set that up because realizing that he was this little meek kid, you know, headed off to military school. And if you see pictures of us at military school, it's like, uh, kid, kid, Dale, you know, so <laughs> he was very little, very short, very scrawny. And, um, and again, life at home, uh, you know, your dad and, and stepmom are gone all the time. It's just you and what you've known is a way in the relationship that we had. So it, it seemed only natural for me. I know it sounds absurd to so many people, um, to, to go do that. But, uh, you know, if you, if you understand the dynamics of, all the situation, it makes a lot of sense. Well, I guess in, in that case, you know, you, you raced late model a bit, you did some racing yourself, and then you actually started in college for criminal justice before changing to business. I guess, what about the business world called to you and, and what made you decide that that's where you wanted to make your mark? 
I just felt like that criminal justice was pretty limited. I really, I like the investigative side of criminal justice and diving into, in, you know, trying to figure things out. But, um, you know, I don't really remember specifically. I, I, I know why I changed to business and it was just from a broad perspective. It's like, okay, what, what am I going to study? I'm going to study business. And then I have a minor in production and operations management, which is strange and weird uh, numbers and that kind of thing. But I'm a very black and white person. So back then it wasn't a strange pick. Marketing to me back then was, was, you know, not something that I was comfortable with and understood. I w I'm not a salesperson. I, you know, that kind of thing. I'm just a very black and white, let the data speak to itself, let the numbers, let the, let the process speak for itself, you know, and um, how you come out of that. So uh, I just thought that I could just really have more of a broad major to do a lot of different things. And, 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 you know, looking back now, all that worked out for the best. Very cool. And, and I guess that's kind of a perfect segue to kind of one of the next things I want to talk to you about. And, you know, you mentioned that, um, you know, leaving DEI um, was very difficult for you and your relationship with Rick Hendrick was, was really important to that. Um, and you, the thing that I thought was interesting is you mentioned the marketing a bit and marketing and PR were actually very central to, to a lot of what you did business wise. And you had said that when Dale did his contract with Hendrick, you actually wanted to make sure that you still maintain control over the marketing and, and PR side of things because you, you mentioned it wasn't typical for, you know, like people to do that. It kind of more went through the race team. I know like when we had uh, Elio Castroneves on the show a couple of years ago, I had to go through Team Penske in order to get that done. Yeah. Um, I guess for you, like what made you understand the true importance of like brand management and identity management? Because that's really vital, honestly. Well, you know, my dad, they really set things up that way for my dad. And so he really was in control of a lot of his own uh, situations and, and those types of moments um, when he drove for Richard Childress Racing and then at Delanhar Incorporated, um, you know, the trouble that we had in trying to do for Dale and, and make our way for Dale and the things that we wanted to control and not do, we just knew going into another team that we wanted to have our finger on that pulse and wanted to be able to uh to make those calls and, and, and call those shots. Um, you know, in, in, in today's environment, that's really changed a lot because um, the cohesiveness and, and the different agendas of people really get in the way in our sport. And mm -hmm. so trying to keep those things more cohesive and, you know, now a lot of teams are really wanting to, when a driver comes to drive for them, they want to kind of, uh, have all of those kinds of things at their hands and control. And, um, and I think people are a lot more open to it now too, to, to have the teams involved um, because it just seems to make a lot more sense. But, you know, we, we really probably mostly because of the experience that we had at Down Home Incorporated, we just knew that we wanted to, to, to control those things ourselves. Um, and it was a great move for us. And when you have a good partner to work with, you really don't have to worry about that too much. You work together on it. Um, and it's just that when you, have a bad partnership, you want to make sure that those things are in your control. Right. And I, and I just, I, I feel like you were a bit ahead of the curve on that because I do, I, what was it like 2007 or 2008 when that change happened and you know, like social media and online branding, a lot of stuff has absolutely exploded since then. And I think in a lot of ways that puts you guys ahead of the curve that you kind of had that foresight to look at that. Yeah. You know, it, and it just, I mean, we didn't do it for reasons for that, not knowing, but uh, it certainly was a, a good timing. I talked about that in my book too, right? They're just good timing and, and timing on decisions. Um, and sometimes you know why they're happening the way they are and sometimes you don't. But um, yeah, it was a, a, a good time in that regard for, to, to set ourselves up that way. Well, you, you actually mentioned, you know, talking about decision making in your book, you, you talked about the idea, and I feel like this is super hard. So, you know, well done on you for being able to do this. But you talk about the idea of removing your own self-interest from a decision in order to be able to make a better decision. I guess in, in practice, what does that look like for you then and how you look at and handle a problem if you're trying to just, I guess, look at it from that viewpoint? Well, I mean, I think that's just kind of the honest way to go about it. Like if I have my own motive at hand i'm not gonna make a see a clear decision and a clear path i mean i can't make the decision from my angle only so um you know removing yourself and and looking at it you know if you weren't involved in it what would you want the outcome to be what would you you know want the situation to be i just you know i can't 
I mean, it's just the most honest, logical way to look at it. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of people can't do that or can't see that or, you know, they can't put their own uh, motive or agenda out of the way. And, um, and you know, that can be hard. So, but it's, it's definitely just from nothing else, just an honest, right way to do it. Well, you'd also mentioned as well, and like, I never thought about it like this, Kelly, but you mentioned like also going around to the people that the decision affects and kind of, I guess, like surveying them a bit. And I guess in the way that you've, you know, run JRM Motorsports, like, like how has that whole thing, you know, worked in, I guess, in action for you guys when you're kind of deciding what to do? Um, you know, it, it, it sort of sounds like you run a business by committee, but it's really not. So, I mean, we, you know, I, I just want to ask the questions so that I'm not, I'm, I don't work on the floor with X amount of people every day or understand, you know, so I think it's important that you understand what they're going through. You see it through their lens. You ask the questions, you know, if this were to happen, how would this affect you? If we decide to make this decision, what am I not thinking about? Because I'm only looking at it through my lens um, and my lens doesn't touch everything. And uh, so, you know, doing it like that, you, you learn a lot for one because you learn, you know, looking at it from a different perspective and thinking of things that, that you may not have thought of. And, and that, that's what I love about it is that I'm not the smartest person on the block um, and collaborating and, and trying to uh, understand it from soup to nuts and you can make a better decision at the end of the day as well. But I guess then like from that standpoint, like, like how do you decide, I guess, who's going to be... I guess in your corner is kind of the wrong word, but who's going to be like on that, that panel of experts for you? Like, how do you decide who's the right person? Ask all kinds of different from? people. Yeah. I want to ask, and I don't want to ask the people that are in my corner either. Right. Right. You right. want to, you want to, you want a difference of opinion. You want, uh, um, you know, different facets of the situation. Um, and, uh, so yeah, it, you, you want to, you know, survey and that, 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 that is sometimes how we go about it the wrong way. Right. We ask all our friends, well, of course, what are your friends going to say? <laughs> be on your side, right? They're not going to tell you anything you don't want to hear kind of thing. Um, but, uh, so, you know, uh, a diverse group of people with an understanding, uh, is a, is a, a good audience to kind of test that out. But there's also things that you just can't ask and do. I mean, sometimes you have to make a decision that's in the best, you know, we realize that we can't please everyone. We can't, we're not all going to think about things the same. We're not all going to handle things the same. Um, and, uh, you know, and sometimes you just have to make a decision and be confident in that from a management perspective. Well, you had, I, I guess from, from that idea of, of, you know, making the right decisions for people and kind of, you know, making the right decision for them. One of the things that you, you mentioned that um, when you're in action performance, you're always really good at, is, you know, you always thought about like, how can I help the sponsor? How can I support the sponsor from my viewpoint? And like in racing, that's super vital to like keeping the team going, keeping everything that you're doing going. I guess from your viewpoint, like how much importance do sponsorships play in racing? And I guess in terms of the economics of running a race team, like how much does it cost to make these things go right? Because I think people just don't have total perspective on like what you guys actually have to do to keep a race team going annually. Yeah, our race team, you know, from a sponsorship perspective, we run off about, uh, we need about 80% of funding from a sponsorship versus 20% from our prize winnings um, on the racetrack. So, um, you know, it takes a lot to uh, do what we do and get the funding that we do. And so that's why it's so important between really, you know, it. I, I'm going to parlay this to politics, but not in a lot of the same ways. But right. You have a group or really anything, you have a group of constituents, you know, my constituents are our fans and our sponsors. And so, you know, trying to um, uh, do what's in their best interest, do something that they're going to engage in. It's no different than when we started this conversation. I said, let's talk, let's talk about what you want to talk to that's for your audience. You know, your <laughs> audience best, right? Um, and so, uh, you know, understanding the fans, understanding the sponsors, understanding what their needs are, you know, is really important to making uh, this team uh, go round because, you know, that's what keeps us on the racetrack and, and keeps us uh, going in the right direction and staying on track. So, uh, and, you know, when we sit down with sponsors, that's what we want to know. What, what do you want out of this? You know, what assets are you trying to drive so on and so forth? And then we can plug and play. A lot of people will sit down and say, okay, this is just what we have to offer you. You know, mm -hmm. well, what if none of those things fit? 
Right. You know? So you want to listen to them and you want to understand what are they trying to achieve and then think through, okay, what assets do we have to achieve that? We maybe there are some of the ones in the list of 10, but maybe they're not. Maybe we have to think outside of the box and think more creative about maybe how we make something work. Where did you learn to do that from? Because it, you, had, you had mentioned in the book that, that the fans and sponsors were two things you learned right away were like super important. But I guess, where do you feel like you picked that up? Really from my dad. I mean, that was always something that was super important to him, uh, something that he always kept at the forefront of all of his decisions and all of his interactions. And so that kind of aiming for the win-win that I talk about in the book from a, you know, finding a win-win on both sides is really from him and, and knowing, you know, the fans and the sponsors and how they were so important to the sport, even back then uh, to now. And uh, so I give a lot of credit to dad when it comes to, to that was something that I always remember him talking so much about and, and, and understanding from him. Absolutely. Well, you had mentioned as well, you know, you mentioned working with your brother and, you know, that being a family situation, but you also mentioned, and you talked about this a bit in your book, you talked about um, when Tony Sr. had to be let go from the racing team because it just wasn't a great fit. I guess in terms of like looking at things with a family perspective, because I know my wife's my business partner and we, we work pretty well together, but I guess, how, is it harder, easier? Like, like, how do you make those things work? Because sometimes, you know, the dynamic does come home with you in a lot of ways. Yeah, it does. Uh, my husband and I are the same way. We both work here at Junior Motor Sports and, and uh, we're constantly, I feel like we're, you know, I feel like we're constantly working because at home we're still having conversations about work. <laughs> um, setting some boundaries around that is always a good thing, but it's not always. We, we do the same thing. We're like this time of night, it gets shut off. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, and it, that's the hard thing about working with family is to um, keep the relationship separate. And, and I think that, you um, you know, sometimes it goes well, sometimes it doesn't when you can keep the personal relationship versus the business relationship uh, and the reasons why you would make a decision one way or the other. And um, it just takes a lot of maturity and, and experience and, and respect between people to be able to make that happen um, and to go on about your relationship outside of work if you've had a problem with your relationship, you know, inside of work. And not everybody can do that and achieve that. And uh, it's something that's, um, pretty it's fairly difficult um, but it'd be way more harder like in a me and Dale situation or me and my husband situation than it would be you know um, uh, somebody else that was related to you just because like you said you got to go home with her right <laughs> <laughs> and, and and that situation sometimes you really need to clear that up and I we have had situations yeah. like that so I totally yeah. get it yeah. <laughs> well I guess like and in, 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 like I said, I really enjoyed this book, just being a racing fan myself. I guess from your standpoint, like, yes, you put this out because you want to help people and, you know, you want to get attention for what you're doing. But I guess at the same time, there's also a benefit to you from just putting it together. And yeah. I guess in that standpoint, how did this, this book serve you in the process of just creating it? Yeah, you know, really, the reason I wanted to write the book, um, I started the process 18, 19 months ago, and, and the publisher of Dell's book said, have you ever thought about writing a book? And I really had not thought about writing it, but I said, if I did want to write a book, this is what I'd want to talk about. And I'd want to talk about my relationship with my dad uh, because I want people, the, the interactions that we have with fans and all that, you know, they'll say to me all the time, your dad was so great, so great. And in the back of my mind, I'm like, he was a great race car driver, but I have all these conflicting messages popping up in my head, you know, about him as a dad. And so I just wanted to share that with people so that it was out there. And that was kind of part of my healing process and my own therapy process of kind of wrapping a bow on that and, and being okay with that. And then she said, you know, you really should think about the business aspect of, of your experience and how that could, uh, you know, help people. And uh, I talked earlier to someone about, you know, that they asked me if i um, now and then when I passed, what do I want people to remember or think about me in this capacity? And I said, I want people now, I want people to know they matter. And when I'm dead, I want them to say, you know, Kelly made me feel really good. She made me feel like I mattered. I was worth something. I was worth talking to, you know, I was worth being cared about. And, um, and that's why I wrote the book too, because I feel like that kind of message, that vulnerability and that message comes out in, in just how honest and, you know, you feel like you're just kind of having a conversation with me. I feel like from the book, um, and it's just kind of real down to earth and it's not this blueprint. It's always 
even the things, the things I talk about in the book will be forever changing, you know, and, and, and um, so that's really why I wanted to do the book was for, for all of those reasons. Um, and ultimately just if somebody scoops a little nugget from it, you know, then that's great. Well, I guess, you know, like you, you mentioned, you know, your, your dad's passing Kelly and, and that event in the racing world, um, it changed a lot of things. And I, and I guess from the standpoint of like, you know, like Dale senior was at the top of the racing world at that point in time. And, you know, they, they were fighting for, I think it was like second and third at that point in yep. the race. And, um, it wasn't that Na like NASCAR had always paid attention to safety, but I don't think to that level until that happened because the sport hadn't lost somebody of his caliber. So I, I guess from, from your perspective, I know we had the Hans device coming in. We were looking at the safer barriers and stuff like that. Do you feel like that racing has done a better job handling driver safety, you know, since that happened with your dad? Cause I, cause from my perspective, I think even, you know, we saw what happened at Ryan Newman in Daytona this year and, and he walked away. Yeah. So, well, after several days walked away, but like, do you think yeah. racing has done a better job handling the drivers now? Yeah, I think they definitely have. And, um, you know, it's kind of unfortunate that it took something of that magnitude to make it happen, but, right. um, uh, you know, they definitely, uh, have, have come a long ways. It's something they pay attention to, you know, and even now, like after an accident with Ryan, uh, even though he pretty much come away unscathed, you know, they still take that car and they look at things and they look at all the metrics and a lot all the data and see if there's anything else they can do, you know, because he was in the hospital for a certain amount of days or this, that, and the other. So, you know, they, it's something that's kind of continuous, which is um, really awesome to see. And people ask me now, you know, would you ever get, would you ever just want to get in the race car and, you know, go take a couple laps? I'm like, you don't know how difficult that is these days with the safety enhancements and with everything, you know, driving a late model and jumping in my old late model that I used to jump in and jumping in one of these cars now is just so totally different um, from a technology standpoint and safety standpoint uh, that it's doggone near impossible. We got to get pretty familiar with uh, what's happening. Yeah, I was listening to, to MRN radio, I think that that night and they were talking about um, like Newman's car was already in, in Charlotte like that evening. And I think it's just to see your sport have a commitment to the drivers, which really are, you know, the most important part of the sport is, is just a really vital thing, I think, moving forward. Yeah. And, you know, they've, uh, they've extended it, you know, to the crews and the helmets and the procedures on pit road and things like that, you know, the speeds, uh, even the fans, you know, because a few years ago we had a car go up in the grandstands at Daytona and some of the improvements and things that they've made there as well. So, um, you know, it, obviously we have a very dangerous sport, inherently mm -hmm. dangerous, and um, but whatever you can do to to make it the safest that you can is prudent. You know, it's something that we should be doing. Absolutely. Well, Kelly, we've been handling you know some very weird times right now. We've had a lot of the eye racing and stuff like that happening, and I know motorsports are hopefully going to start up again soon. But I guess you know that aside. You know, where do you see, I guess, motorsports going in the next five or 10 years? Because we have seen the car bodies change. We've seen a lot of stuff change. I guess, from your perspective, where do you see it going? Well, I wish we had a crystal ball so we could figure, you know, figure out where we need to be, right? Um, right. But, uh, I think NASCAR's done a good job. You know, I think you saw a lot of momentum in the last half of the season and, and moving into this season um, with the TV viewers and the fans and the engagement that the sport uh, has been receiving. And really, you know, it'll be interesting to see coming out of this break, what iRacing has done because you're, they were talking about so many unique uh, streamers and unique visits that um, people, I even saw a comparison to the iRacing stream versus so many people, hundreds of thousands of people that would never watch a NASCAR race or watching the virtual racing. So, um, you know, it'll be interesting to see if that, parlays over into uh, when we get back on the track. But, um, you know, just the the collectiveness and the collaboration that NASCAR has really been doing with the teams and, and, you know, the fan council and the motorsport tracks to really try to um, work more closely together on what the sport looks like and the changes that they want to make and so on and so forth, um, you know, I think are productive and helpful. Um, I, you know, who knows what it looks like? I mean, we, but I think what's important um, and, you know, you talked about this just in 2007 when we talked, when we wanted to bring everything under our own control and our own roof. The thing that's important about all of these decisions and transition is just being able to adapt, right? Mm -hmm. And being flexible, uh, being open-minded uh, so that you can look at things and adapt 
um, to what needs to be changed or, or something, the way something's going and handling. I mean, who knew 10 years ago we'd be in the middle of social media the way we are and using it the way we are and consuming things the way we are. Um, and so being able to adapt to that and adjust to that is what's really important so that you don't fall by the wayside. I guess from the iRacing perspective, the thing that's been cool for me is it's given us more of a, a glimpse into the driver's lives. Like I think even uh, Jamie McMurray's daughter has become a little bit of a celebrity because she keeps popping up uh, in the different races too, which has been kind of cool. Yeah, you get to see their personalities and they get to have a little fun with it, um, you know, too. So so that's always nice. And, we, you know, they've been able to treat that as something fun, which on race day at the racetrack, you know, tensions are high, expectations are high and so on and so forth. So maybe you don't see as much of that. But um, uh, I think a lot of the drivers do, though, uh, you know, throughout the week, show a lot of personality and, and get to you know, show off their families if they want to and things like that so that you can try to get to know them better. But you're right. Yeah. Who, what, I think, what was it, uh, Denny Hamlin this past weekend, I guess maybe his daughter did something. It was a headline on Fox news this morning. She ran in and lost in the race. (laughs) Yeah. It made him. Yeah. You know, so like how often does that happen? (laughs) Well, I, I guess Kelly, just as we're running a little bit low on time here, if we were to take a look at something you believed at 21 that you don't believe now, what would you say that is? Something that I believed at when I was 21. Oh gosh. Um, something that I believed that I'm 21 that I don't think now. Oh gosh, I don't know. It's such a hard question to look back because experience and perspective and age change you so much, right? right. So you want to say, oh, well, I should have been drinking at 21 or whatever. But then, I, <laughs> but then I look at my 19 year old and I go, I was you once. I know what you're doing, you know? Um, gosh. Uh, I don't know, probably I, for me, when I look back at my life, I wish I would have been more present mm. in moments. Um, I was the kind of person that always looked to pad. What's next? What do I have to do next, fix next, achieve next, conquer next, whatever. And I realize, you know, trying to look back and have memories is, is, is really tough when you're not present and when you're not in the moment. Um, and so, Probably that. Very cool. If we were far in the future, Kelly, and you could sum up your legacy with a quote on your tombstone, what does that look like? Uh, that she always made people matter. Wow. Yeah. Well, Kelly, this has been awesome. Once again, the book is Drive, Nine Lessons to Win in Business and in Life. And as I said, I literally just finished it this morning. So I really recommend everybody go out and pick it up. Where can they find out more about you and more about everything you're doing, Kelly? Yeah, so they can uh, go to kellyearnhartdrive.com and they can find out information where they can purchase the book right now. Um, one thing I didn't talk about in my book was consistency because my social media handles, all three are different. On Instagram, I'm Kelly Earnhardt Miller. On Facebook, I'm Kelly K. Earnhardt. And on Twitter, I'm Earnhardt Kelly. So uh, follow us there, Junior Motorsports. We're um, on social as well if you want to find out more about the race team. And uh, yeah. Awesome. Well, Kelly Earnhardt Miller, thank you so much for hanging out with me today on the Create Your Own Life show. Thank you. I enjoyed it.